for this giving me an will to now be recorded. We're now going on record, as you've all heard there. So I hope everybody's staying safe and um, being as productive as they can be, given circumstances now. Um, I do want to uh, apologize in advance for whatever might happen here. I've locked my doors against my kids barging in, but I think we all have experienced um, that happening at some point or another. So if that happens and you hear some screaming in the background, um, you were warned. <laughs> so let's see what we can do. So um, this is a, a great group of people. Uh, we've got 93 folks on the call. It's just a great spirit of collegiality uh, within this space. And I think it's, it's really wonderful that folks can come together to help each other. So uh, here's what we want to go through today. Uh, Carol has uh, already done the introduction, which is great. Uh, we're going to do some of the polling that we did last time. We're going to ask the same questions that we asked last time around just to see how things may have evolved. And we'd love to have everyone participate in that polling. The more answers we get, the more robust the data, the more valuable it is for everybody. So participation is super easy. All you need to do, the easiest way, would be to get your cell phone and open up a browser and go to the URL that you see listed there, moveon.participol.com. And when you go there, uh, you'll see a, just a blank screen there. And when we get to the questions, the response keys will appear there. And you just click on it and you'll be able to vote. So it's best to do it on a cell phone so that you can still see the screen in front of us. Um, if you don't have your cell phone handy, you can, of course, just open up another browser window if you want and just split the screen between the deck that you're seeing uh, and the polling. So it works on your desktop as well. So we'll do that. Uh, and then we're going to be having the meat of our discussion today. We've got some guests with us uh, and we're very grateful for their volunteering to share their innovations. Um, we're going to just go through and, as Carol said, spend a few minutes learning about what each uh, guest has done and ask some questions there. We very much welcome your questions, of course. Participation is what brings the value here, so don't be shy. The way that will work the participation is if you have a question or a comment, we just ask you to write the word hand in the chat function. So uh, the chat function, if you haven't discovered it already, is in your control panel on the left hand, sorry, the right hand side. And there's a little speech bubble there. If you click on that, uh, you will see a place where you can enter whatever you want to enter. So you can actually have continued discussions with folks on the side if you want. But if you do want to uh, chime in and make a comment or ask a question, just type hand and we'll do our best to make sure we call on people in order. And when we call you out, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, otherwise, everyone is on mute by default. And then uh, once we're done with that, uh, Julio will make some conclusions for us and then we'll be wrapped up. So without further ado, let's get into the polling. Again, if you could go to that URL, moveon.participol.com. And the first question we'd like to ask you all is, is your office now operating under new guidelines governing partnership development as a result of the COVID-19 crisis? And we have uh, A, yes, B, no, C, unsure. If there are folks that can't see the deck, if you're just on your phone, a, yes, B, no, C, unsure that you're operating under new guidelines governing partnership development as a result of the recent crisis. And we've got just under 100 folks on the call. It would be great if we could get to six, 60 or 70 re responses. And if you're kind of sitting on the sidelines wondering if you should get involved, you definitely should. Um, it, as I said, it makes it better for everybody. So please do grab your cell phone and pop in a vote here. Okay, and we'll close it down in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you everybody for voting. And let's see what people say. Okay, so it looks like most people are not operating it under any new guidelines as a result of COVID. Um, this was the result from the call that we had a few weeks ago on April 20th. So it looks pretty similar. It looks like there's a small portion of folks who have moved from the no into the yes piece, but it uh, looks pretty similar. Okay. Our next poll is, if not stopped, how would you describe the pace of partnership development as compared to normal? And that would be your definition of normal, however your institution normally operates. 
Is it A, significantly increased pace of partnership development? B, mildly increased? C, as normal? D, mildly increased? Or E, significantly decreased as compared to normal? And again, that's the pace of partnership development as compared to normal. And again, I'd just like to remind everybody, um, we have you all on mute by default, but sometimes we inadvertently unmute ourselves. If you've done that, if you could just keep an eye on your mute button and make sure that we, uh, that we stay mute, that'll keep the background noise down to a minimum. Thank you. Okay, we'll close it down in five, four, three, two, one. Please get your votes in. We're so close to 60, so close to 60. Maybe we can get one more person next time around. Okay, so you can see the, the, uh, the numbers from last time and this time. Uh-oh, what happened there? There we go, okay. So it looks like most folks have a mild decrease there. Uh, before the poll just went away on us, unfortunately. But we will have that data captured and we'll get it out to you uh, after the call. But it looked like there's a, a big growth in D over last time. So a big growth in a mild decrease in terms of the pace of partnership development. Okay. So let's go to our next poll. Is there an official hold on the agreement approval process for your partnerships? Is it A, yes, B, no, or C, unsure? And forgive me, I, I'm getting a lag in my system here. There's something that's screwing up. Just give me a second and I'm all gonna go back a slide and we're gonna give this another shot. So before you answer that, let's just go into this again. Is there an official hold on the agreement approval or renewal process for your partnerships? Is it A, yes, B, no, or C, unsure? Okay, we'll close it down in five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what folks think. Okay, so not much change at all this time around. And last time, it was similar. Okay, so it looks like there's not many holds out there. Things still proceeding, which is good news. Okay, our next question is, if your institution has implemented a travel ban that affects your office, for how long is that ban currently in effect? Is it A, there is no ban, B, through May, C, through June, D, through July, E through August, F through September, or G sometime beyond that. And um, I get the sense that we've all got our eyes on this this number because, of course, it influences a lot of how we conduct business. You know, will we be able to resume the face-to-face -face portion of our jobs? Uh, and if so, when? Okay, please get your votes in. We'll close it down in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Okay. So we've got a good third of our, of our audience here that is beyond September. So folks are looking really into Q4 of this year. Um, and then a good group that is canceled through the summer, which is interesting. Okay, very good. And these were the numbers from last time. You can see there's a big growth in G there of being beyond the summer. So it looks like a lot of institutions are really locking things up for, for the foreseeable uh, remainder of this year. Okay, um, our next question is, are you still granting invitations to travelers planning to visit your institution in the fall? Is it A, yes, B, unsure, or C, I'm sorry, A, yes, B, no, or C, unsure? 
And this question has come up just for the planning over the fall. I know a lot of travelers need invitations to go through the administration that they need to to get travel arranged. And the group was wondering you know, to what extent are people still issuing those invitations? We'll close down in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you for getting your votes in. Appreciate it. We still haven't cracked that 60 number. We've gotten very close. Okay. So most folks are, a good half of our folks are still trying to figure that out. If we compare it to last time, looks like there's increasing uncertainty. So uh, institutions that were granting those are now not so sure that they're going to continue. Okay. And um, our next question is, is your office engaging with any international education agencies or councils for support with COVID-19 management? Is it A, yes, B, I'm so sorry. Is it A, no, B, yes, or C, unsure? A, no, B, yes, C, unsure. Okay, we'll close down in five, four, three, two, one. Please get your votes in. And we are right down the middle of three-way tie, it looks like, all the way all the way through. Okay, and compared to last week, it looks like we've got uh, a few more saying that they have not engaged yet. Uh, and a few more with B as well. Okay, um, our last poll question, which we thought would be a little bit fun and get people to think about the future of our function. What one word would you use to describe what international offices will need to be really good at 12 months from now? I think of some one word de de description of what, what offices need to be very strong in, in order to be successful, if you project what you think things will be like in 12 months. So just choose one word. Um, if you can't choose one word, you can use a hyphen. I guess that's all right. <laughs> but try to use one word. The word cloud here will show us uh, really what the popular words are for this. And this is just a way to get people to think about, if we try to prepare ourselves for what's coming, what should our offices be focused on getting really good at? Give you another couple seconds there to type something. Okay, we'll close it down in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you everybody for writing in. Now let's see what comes up here. Let's see if we get any sort of collection. All right, so creativity, virtual, communication seem to be our popular words for this one. And then some others that seem similar as well. But I think we've all got somewhat of a similar outlook on there being an uncertain element to all of this. Um, I'm seeing unemployment. There's some sort of dark sounding ones as well. Okay, so thank you everybody for participating in this portion of our call. We'll have this data compiled and made available to anybody uh, who wants it, um, just so you can get back in touch with us and we'll get that to you. Very good, so I'd now like to turn to the, uh, the second portion of our call and having our guests uh, speak. And um, again, a big, uh, thank you to to those who will be speaking today for sharing their innovations. Um, I know, given all the different things that we're all tackling now, to keep things, you know, keep the path straight here, there's just a lot of learning that we can we can get from others who are going through those different challenges. So um, I'd like to welcome Gwen to begin. Um, Gwen, are you on the call? I am, and I think I'm on mic. Is that true? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Fantastic. So thank you, thank you for for being here. Please, please go ahead. And again, just as some background, we've asked our guests just to speak about the challenge that they were facing, 
of what they've done to address that challenge. So thank you, Gwen. Appreciate it. So I actually wanted to highlight um, two things that we've been working on over the last few weeks. Um, uh, the first is really around our international partnerships. So at the University of Toronto, we have a number of international partners with whom we have uh, shared funding schemes of one sort or another. So either seed grants or uh, joint workshops to deepen collaboration in a particular topic which we would hope that would evolve over time and be funded at a higher level and we also have doctoral mobility exchange so a sort of co tutel model with um, partner institutions where we're driving research collaboration through the exchange over multiple years of doctoral students all of those of course have relied to date on face-to-face -face collaboration. Um, our assumption to the questionnaire that just we all just participated in is that uh, we won't be getting back on a plane for collaboration anytime in the near future, not because our institution has banned us from doing so, but because of larger societal forces that will mean it's impractical for, for a number of reasons. Um, and that will probably vary a bit from country to country, so it depends where the partnerships are, but um, we expect that, that will, it'll be quite a while before those open up. Um, we've also, and I think this came up in our last call, we've been looking at the last year or so about, uh, or more around um, the uh, climate change, the, um, the impact of getting on a plane and encouraging collaboration face-to-face -face at all times uh, and what that does from a climate perspective. So we were already looking at ways to encourage and, and reduce that travel while still staying in a framework of uh, seeing a very deep value to global collaboration, international um, research projects. So we're developing a framework around how best to support our PIs to have those workshops, that doctoral mobility, do that seed grant funding, uh, seed grant projects uh, online. And we're developing a toolkit for virtual workshops, uh, which we are developing with our, our research colleagues. We're doing a lot of virtual uh, workshops within U of T as well as with partners externally. So as a first step towards that, we've been meeting with all of our top partners with whom we have these, these co-funded uh, projects and uh, discussing with them and co-developing a framework for virtual collaboration, ensuring that the collaboration doesn't stop, but is um, supported and facilitated through a toolkit that our, our um, department is, is is creating in order to encourage and support PIs for that that online engagement. So that's one of the things we're doing and I expect a number of my colleagues on this call are, are thinking in similar ways. For that reason we've actually been very busy in discussion with partners over the last few weeks and have found that a number of our partners are also thinking in this way and are very open to co-creating. So that's been a, a terrific way to continue to uh, enhance and value those partnerships uh, while trying to <laughs> flex to new models. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to share with folks that we've been really excited about is less about international partnerships, but we just launched something called a student engagement micro grant scheme. So we've taken some of the funding that we are not spending on uh, getting on planes for the next well, let's assume till the end of this calendar year anyway, and, and international travel is going to be complicated and probably quite a bit more expensive in the next few years. And we have uh, put some of that money towards what we're calling student engagement micro grants, where a team of minimally two students, undergraduate or graduate, can apply to us for a small grant of $3,000. It'll be stipendary support for them and it can be in any discipline across the university. Uh, it's a way to engage them uh, globally so all projects have to have a global component either global collaboration with other students or a global uh, framework or remit uh, to the project that they're doing but it can be as broad as an art project or a podcast or a blog that's being launched or more traditional research um, 
you know, a lab or a data visualization, engineering, et cetera. So really trying to conceive broadly of how we support both our domestic and our international students in continuing to engage in a global um, mindset, but also to engage with one another in a time where uh, many of us are, are feeling quite isolated. So um, that's, I'm quite happy to share the link uh, to our website uh, for that grant. We just launched it last week and we've already had over 2,000 people take a look at the website. We'll see what the application volume is, but uh, a, a, a fun and a great way to support our students and support a global outlook um, during a time when um, people are feeling isolated and uh, very vulnerable from a financial perspective as well. I wanted to share that. Thank you, Gwen. Would you be would you be willing to put that link in the chat for folks to get? I am just if, doing if you've that. You've got a handy. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Are there questions for Gwen? And again, if you've got questions or comments, please type the word "hand" into the chat, and we'll make sure to call on you. And um, you can just unmute yourself and and please ask your question. Are there others that have, perhaps as you're thinking about that, um, uh, and I'll, uh, oh, Carol, okay. please, please please go ahead. But as you guys are thinking about that, is anyone else doing something similar? Carol, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Gwen. Thank you for, for sharing your um, innovations with us today. And I'm one of those folks that's also looking at a similar tool as the one you described for supporting um, ongoing collaborations. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more about what that toolkit includes and, and what you have found when talking to your PIs at your university and your partners. What are they highlighting as being more critical components of that toolkit? Um, so I think, first of all, it's helping them sort through the plethora of different uh, options in terms of uh, online tools, um, what works, what doesn't, and what the considerations are for that. The second piece is how to even conduct the online um, uh, workshop and, and some of the best practices around that. So we're planning a focus group with uh, some of our PIs just to understand what their struggles or concerns might be as we develop that out. Um, uh, we see some huge advantages to this in terms of being able to include a, a greater number of people than we could afford to put on planes. So it might be much more inclusive of, of graduate students. But then how do you sort of do uh, norms up at the beginning so people truly are engaged during the time that they're online rather than doing three other tasks at once, which I think all of us are struggling with a bit right now. Um, so it's, it's really sort of walking through the considerations both from formally how to conduct that workshop to um, what different tools, and there are a number of different tools with pros and cons, uh, might be available to them. Um, so fairly straightforward, um, uh, but really trying to engage uh, PIs who I think are feeling very overwhelmed in terms of putting courses online, et cetera, with some easy how-tos rather than asking them to start de novo um, the thinking on that. What are you working on, Carol? What's your thinking on that? We're taking a similar approach and um, we just started, so we're not as advanced as you are, but um, working through our Center for Learning as well as our IT. You need to get some guidance to putting something, as you said, something easy and accessible, recognizing that there's a number of pressures on, on our researchers right now and wanting to make the complex as simple as possible for them. Um, we haven't yet, and I think that's a really great idea, uh, engaging our partners in co-creating this. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see how that develops for you. Yeah, but yeah, we're, we're, we're hoping that th those partners will equally support their PIs to sort of think about this and, and um, you know, provide some supportive tools. So everything, I mean, uh, also just a sort of checklist of things to consider from time difference to language issues to cultural differences. So just being aware of those things and highlighting them at the beginning as one is creating those toolkits. Um, 
I think can be helpful uh, just so people think through all the different uh, issues that contribute to a successful event when you may be spanning a 12 hour uh, time difference, for instance. Thanks, Carol. Gwen, I was actually, I was going to ask as well, and this um, this could pertain to either one of the, the innovations that you shared, but are there any sort of potential pitfalls or suggestions or watch out warnings that you might give folks who might pursue doing the same thing at their institution? Um, I, I think we're too young in this process, too early in this process to know yet. Um, uh, I think the, the biggest thing we're hearing from our institutions, and Carol, I think you just uh, confirmed that from your perspective as well, is just to be a little um, sensitive to the demands on PIs right now and to work within structures that uh, are helpful to them rather than uh, coming up with an innovation and getting all enthusiastic about it and being a bit tenured to uh, what their needs are at the moment. So that's a, that's not a pitfall, but it's a sensitivity that um, certainly our office is um, very aware of and uh, managing. So Very good. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments for Gwen? Okay. Well, Gwen, thank you very much for sharing. We appreciate your contributions. Can I just thank you? Um, with with um, apologies to all my colleagues on the call, I I do need to jump off. Um, but I look forward to hearing about the the discussion later. And I'm so sorry I couldn't participate in more of it. No problem. Thanks for being with us. Okay, let's move on to our next guest. Uh, we have Taryn and Emily from UBC. And um, Emily, I'm going to offer my apologies right away. I wasn't able to find a photo of you uh, online that I could verify as being you. So it's nothing personal, just had some challenges there. <laughs> so uh, Taryn and Emily, are you both with us? Hi there, yep. Yeah. I am here as well, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Very good, well, yes, yeah, yeah, both loud and clear. Okay, great. So well, please go ahead and share. Oh, Thank oh. you for being with us. Oh, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my um, colleague, Emily, she's going to start us off uh, with a, a few updates um, around our partnership landscape right now and initiatives. Awesome. Thanks, Taryn. Um, so, yeah, first I'll start with some thoughts on the partnership landscape and engagement, um, given the current environment and a lot of what we've already heard so far very much rings true to what we're thinking about. Um, as a part of UBC's new international strategy, one of our focus areas is really thinking about our contribution to a better world by focusing on issues of global relevance, such as those called out in the UN SDGs, um, specifically through engagement with partners on complex global challenges. Um, and we've, we've been thinking about how, how to do this through our partnerships with universities, but also through uh, what we're calling a five C's approach to broadening our partnership cam canvas to include corporates, community organizations, cities and countries. Um, and the challenge I, I think we're all facing to, to a large extent is without travel as a means of engaging with partners um, on advancing this part of our strategy. Uh, uh, we're thinking about new ways to do so. And so we've been thinking about how can we meaningfully engage, build connections or deepen partnerships virtually. Uh, and one of the things that we're looking to convene, looking to do and convene over the next couple of months is, it's not really named mini summits, but we, I could say mini summits online. Uh, these will be conversations that bring together voices to offer food for thought on where things look like they're heading in the context of COVID-19. Uh, and the focus that we're thinking of in terms of topic is thinking about resilience and reinvention um, of the complex political, economic, economic, social, and technological landscape that underpins the creation of prosperous, sustainable, and thriving communities. And so we'll be in, we're inviting, for example, um, our, many of our, our global partners, but also, for example, the president of Ethiopia through our partnership links with that country, um, partners at UNEP, et cetera. Um, and just thinking about how to bring people together from a range of backgrounds to provide food for thought and for collective action. And the audience will be 
We're thinking, you know, youth and young people and students and future leaders of the planet, researchers seeking to work with communities on youth inspired research and for just generally universities seeking to forge some of these creative partnerships that aim uh, to, to think about our long term inclusive resilience and reinvention response to COVID-19. That's Taryn. I'll pass Hi. It <laughs> it's so I can't I can't see you. So um and thank you, Emily. And so I'll follow up with a few, you know, under the the umbrella of global partnerships, a few examples of initiatives uh, that that were and 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 again as as you know both um, Carol and Gwen stated, we're we're at the beginning stages of this. I think with with some of the examples. Uh, absolutely, there were ideas spawned from the COVID-19 crisis, uh, and then in some cases, you know, we're using this as an opportunity to enhance and accelerate uh, some some programs that we had already been talking about. And so, certainly, you know, for those of us who come from specifically from an office that engages in student mobility, I, I mean, I couldn't imagine a, a bigger challenge than. Uh, you know the absence of physical mobility, but we're we're really we're really trying to you know reframe this as an opportunity um, to you know for for me personally, I think create more access uh, to global mobility programs where there has been less access in the past. And I think you know there have been a lot of initiatives over the last few years. Um, for for students who, for a, a, a number of reasons, uh, face multiple barriers in accessing uh, global programming, and and you know where we were able to support with like funding, for example, or with novel uh, program development, we we aren't we aren't now. So isn't this a, a great opportunity to? through you know virtual learning uh, to be able to to be more inclusive and to open up our programming to more students so one one of those programs is a, a virtual class classroom initiative and and we're lucky in that um, through our business school we do have an example of a, a long-running um, virtual uh, classroom network and so we're hoping over the next few months to work with our global partners and community members in, in enhancing that initiative so taking students um, from partners all over the world um, who are able to access a course taught by you know x institution and then work in in global virtual groups around you know a topic of uh yeah international importance um so we're just going to work on that uh, another one as well is with our, our we have a number of faculty-led programs that would that would have started to run right now as i'm sure many of you do as well and so in collaboration with two of our faculty members uh, we're working in support of having those run virtually over the summer um, and i'd like to call it one in particular and it's uh, a course around asian migration which would typically take students to hong kong singapore and malaysia to study um, heritage planning and conservation and so this year we're going to be uh, piloting it online um, using a combination of lectures, readings, as well as virtual tours, um, and then connecting the themes of heritage planning and conservation back to uh, the context in Vancouver. And we have a number of internships uh, set up at local community organizations, which we hope will be able to be in person, but if not, uh, we're also able to support them uh, online as well. And so those are those are two two things we're working on right now we also have an undergraduate uh, virtual undergraduate research conference in the works with one of our partners that will run in september we have um, visiting international research students uh, who would typically you know be physically at ubc uh, over the year if not we are we're now looking at the feasibility of setting up um, um, online or virtual research with uh, supportive faculty members. Uh, we're also as well looking at, you know, as, as Gwen had talked about, um, our awards, the awards and bursaries we would typically be giving students 
to go out, to go abroad and and what we can do what we can do with the funding that we have um, expecting that 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 there won't be any travel at least through the end of the year and one idea is around a student-led seminars uh, which would of course have a global focus and and this is a pre-existing program that is credit bearing so we're going to look at at, at making connections uh, for students to access a bit of money um, through bursary uh, to be able to develop their own course for other students to participate in. Um, and lastly, uh, we, we are shifting our focus on, on looking at a variety of revenue generating programs as well, specifically uh, inbound study abroad. Uh, but but of course, where our thinking is well off into into 2021 and and certainly we don't we don't want to be naive in thinking that this is going to replace you know physical mobility um but it will cert it certainly gives us an opportunity to enhance what we are able to offer hopefully create more access and, and have another option um which for a number of reasons will we'll add to the diversity of of our international programming thanks darren and emily appreciate that are there questions from the group questions or comments and again, please just type the word hand into chat if you've got something to share or a question. And perhaps while you're thinking about questions, I, I have a question, um, and this one might be best directed uh, to you, Taryn. So um, these sound like quite a few great innovations. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, again, acknowledging that these aren't completely done yet or fully baked, but yeah. um, how how long did it take you to conceptualize this and to decide to put it in, into action? I mean, what, what sort of a time frame, um, you know, do you think you were operating oh, under? Great question. <laughs> so some of these, some of these programs, um, let's say the virtual classroom uh, initiative, it, it, it's a pre-existing uh, framework for virtual learning. Um, and just within yeah, just within the last month, um, our um, our pro our provost international has taken this on as a as a major strategic initiative. So we've been able to uh, mobilize quite a lot of uh, support and interest around that. In terms of our faculty-led seminars, it happened pretty quickly. <laughs> so once once we and I mean we have two uh, two seminars that will be running virtually out of 29 um, that we had. So certainly not certainly not an easy thing to do. And and we had two faculty members who were very keen and felt very comfortable working within the space. So that. Uh, that went a long a long way. Um, otherwise, we're we're looking, you know, really what we did was, I mean, we st we started quite quickly coming up with uh, various scenario planning uh, endeavors back in March when it was looking like. I mean, we didn't want to be cynical, but <laughs> when we were looking at, you know, the likelihood of of mobility not not maybe not happening for the rest of the year student mobility uh yeah. we, we research we looked around the university initially and said okay what programs exist what can we do where are there opportunities to amplify you know ideas we've had that we haven't been able to enact and and so this that there are so many moving parts right now um but but we're we're trying that's <laughs> great are there other questions, comments from the group? Carol, please go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, me again. <laughs> Emily, uh, this question is for you, and 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 thank you for sharing um, what you're doing at UBC. It's really intriguing, and and in our last session, there was actually a question that spoke to what you're talking about. So it's interesting to see that thinking being put into action at UBC, and it's pin up some conversations offline for us as well. And one of those questions that's come up is how do, and I'm curious, how are you engaging in your partnerships to deliver on this so that um, it's done in such a way that um, it doesn't center the conversation at the Canadian institution, but it and it doesn't perpetuate some of the sort of colonial framework so that the, the conversation 
can be centered elsewhere and, and be driven by in a, through partnership, um, particularly with our Global South partners. So if you don't mind sharing a little bit more about your partnership model around that delivery. Sure, thanks, Carol. Um, I think within this particular initiative, we're, we're really just looking to convene conversations and um, be, be very broad in how, who, we, who we're asking to be involved. And I don't even wanna say inviting because it's, it's gonna be a fairly kind of broad conversation that we're looking to convene. Um, but no, I hear you. I think that um, that has to be central to, uh, to when you're to programming and to um, bringing multiple voices to the table um so yeah that's definitely something that we're we're thinking about is in this kind of in this particular initiative um and the the way that we're having the conversations is is i mean we're still planning for them this is kind of looking ahead to june but um just having having kind of moderated panels and opportunity to ask questions and similar to this to have people come to the table and share and and ask questions of one another and learn so but I, I agree that 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 needs that's totally fundamental. Thank you, Emily and Taryn. Appreciate your contributions very much. Thank you. Let's move on to our, our next guest. We have Ben from University of South Florida. Ben, are you with us on the call? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Oh, you're welcome. I guess I'm kind of standing in for Dr. Kiki Karusin, who is now our interim vice president of USF World. For those of you who know her, she gets your emails. And uh, she passed this on to me since uh, I've been kind of involved in some of the metrics and decision making uh, processes we're going through about travel and international travel. Uh, in particular, of course. Um, so I have two documents and they're going to be shared with everyone because um, we really want your feedback. We we really like to see if anything in there jumps out or is um, just not, doesn't feel right or could be improved upon. Uh, the one document I want to first share is the indicators for student-related travel, whether or not we want to travel and where we're going to go. And I, by looking at the poll, a lot of you are in the same boat where um, we're coming from. And I, I should say, as an international risk and security officer, I didn't tell you what I do. I monitor a cell phone 24 hours, seven days a week, taking calls internationally for people that run into trouble. I also uh, work with my team on uh, doing risk reviews for all of our student-related travel and sometimes for our faculty and staff business travel. And uh, we provide pre-departure orientations and, and such. So at the University of South Florida, all student-related uh, travel, whether it be education abroad, it could be an independent study, it could be a conference, it could be a student group, must be registered. Um, based upon whether or not the U.S. Department of State um, has a high level, uh, restricted warning level or not, it may end up having to be reviewed by a security team. The big question is, right now we're at CDC level three. For us, that's a no-go in general, or the U.S. Department of State, that's a level four, that's a no-go in general. It's kind of irrelevant because Back in mid-March, uh, the Florida Board of Governors told all state universities, you're not traveling. So we don't even have domestic travel, let alone uh, international travel. And until they reverse that, the discussion of whether or not we're going to travel or how to make that decision is, is really formative. So it's still an open book. Uh, these, what we ran into and frustrated many in my field of risk security was we knew March 11th when the CDC announcements went out uh, banning uh, travel to Europe, CDC level three became a no-go. And I was up all night, 24 hours, trying to pull back a few hundred students. Um, we knew a week or more before that, hey, these numbers happening in Europe are really no different than what we saw in China, what we saw in Korea, 
um, why aren't we pulling the plug now? But the CDC held off, and there's all sorts of theories uh, behind that. So a lot of the discussion is, how, do, how can we make a decision uh, that's not just based to one number? And so I've got this uh, indicator list of about 20 different items looking at not just our insurance provider's assessment, um, what's the visa entry restrictions looking like? Are they going to be testing everyone traveling or not? Uh, what's the host country's alert level or the host country's border restrictions? Heck, between Canada and the U.S., right? Can't travel. Um, what are the stay-at-home restrictions? Are there curfews or not? The list gets quite lengthy, but there are things that we've kind of put into a matrix that we um, are going to use for decision making and whether that travel will go as it would any other time, or would we want to do a heightened risk review, or would we want to restrict it? All in the context of there is no vaccine. There won't be a vaccine for the foreseeable future, at least this next academic year, and we have to structure our decision making with the assumption that the virus, SARS-CoV-2, is in the community. So how do you mitigate that? The second list, and it's more probably focused on the programming aspect is, when you are planning a trip, how are you gonna plan that trip? What are you gonna think about? So we've got all sorts of questions involving first, faculty and staff, do they even wanna go? What about their health? What about their higher risk group? Same with students, do they even wanna go? What should be the uh, faculty to staff ratio if it's a group? Uh, if you have a faculty member that comes down with a common cold and you don't know it, they got to get tested for it, they're still going to be quarantined pretty much anywhere. How are you going to still function with that group abroad when you've got a faculty member in quarantine? You need two. Or do you quarantine the group? Um, looking at how different local communities have handled it, what have they done with their transportation systems? Are they like New York City shutting it down every night and cleaning it? Um, is there going to be any chance for social distancing on buses and whatnot? Housing consideration. I've heard discussions where homestays, some schools absolutely are taking them off the table. Others want to keep them on the table, but how do you structure that? Um, certainly, the idea of a hostel, to me, is pretty scary now. Uh, <laughs> what about universities and dorms? What about areas within the university abroad, whether they be yours, whether they be ours, we're, we're still discussing that, or their exiters, if a student uh, must be quarantined, do they have a location for it? Can they get food to that student? Can they provide Wi-Fi for remote learning? What's a health, what's a healthcare uh, situation like? Um, is it at capacity? Is it under capacity? Do they have surge capacity? Um, maybe it's completely broken. And then there's all sorts of other things that you may want to think about, such as your terms and conditions, your contracts with partners. We're now in the discussions of adding, do we need to add some of these requirements or recommendations or ideal situations into, a into the contracts? Um, it's, I don't get into the contracts. I'm just saying, well, you know, here's some things you want to think about. They can work that out. Um, I know I went a little bit over my five minutes, but those two documents are really our, what we're thinking about. And we certainly want to hear from our friends and partners what's relevant to them and, and maybe give us some guidance as we look forward to possible future travel, maybe not till next year. Thank you, Ben. And um, we can distribute those documents to to the audience. Um, if that's something you'd like to share with, with folks, I'm sure they'd like to see it and give you feedback. Oh, yeah, something absolutely. I sent right. them uh, to Carol earlier, so she can send them out after the uh, session. And with my contact information, anyone feel free to either give me a call on the, uh, you'll see it's 24 international, 24 seven international assistance line. I'm still answering it and uh email me as well that that's great and I will, we'll, we'll try not to call you in the middle of the night i'm sure you've had enough of that <laughs> thank you ben
Uh, we're going to just uh, move on to our last speaker, just in the interest of time. Um, our last speaker is a member of our committee, Carlos. Carlos is from Carlton, and Carlos has a slide that I'm going to pull up right now. Okay, Carlos, welcome. Thank you. Are you are you able to hear me well? Yes, loud and clear. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for the for the IRPLC group for for allowing me to speak at this webinar. My presentation will be a little bit technical, and it will is is focused on little things that we need to do on, a, on an everyday basis in order to make our work uh, moving forward. So there will be three part aspects. One is that we had set certain uh, developments with how we process certain agreements. The second one is that how do we continue to support meetings, international visitors coming to, or wanting to come to Carlton. Now, how do we do that in the COVID-19? And the, sec the third thing has to do with uh, visiting international visitor and scholars. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Dan, please. So um, this this graphic is just to just to to reflect about some of the uh, steps that we go we go we use in order to do the agreement, and as you could see after preliminary discussions, submitting an official request and negotiating the, the accord, then we request for approval from our faculties. Um, the area in red approval, as you could see on the screen, that's the area that we were having some difficulties, and that that is because a number of senior administrators are asked for their approval. And since we're now at home and working uh, remotely, then we reflected a lot about the best way to get this, this uh, approval done. And then we opted for the simplest way, which is uh, via email. Uh, we recognize that this is not very innovative in any way, but we think that it is really effective when it comes to time. And after we received the approval from, from these uh, senior administrators, we then use a platform called DocuSign. And DocuSign is simply an opportunity for the signatory to simply sign the agreement and to be able to, to have it all on record. Now, the, the, the step goes like this when it comes to DocuSign. We basically upload files, specify where the signer could sign, deploy an authentication code for security reasons, and then there is the signatory signs. For us to be able to be sure about using DocuSign, we need to have discussions internally about security, about inf information, about the best way that the different stakeholders could be could be okay with this new procedure, and we needed to do also internal testing. At the end of the day, DocuSign then is able to provide a digital certificate uh, that includes uh, details about the signing, such as time, date, user, and like that, we are certain that that's that's one way to move it forward. So this way, we we are able to move agreements much faster, and perhaps if uh, once we go back to normal, we might consider continue using this method. Unfortunately, we have taken a long time to get the approval part done on, on time, but now we, we were, were, were more confident that this could move things forward because in our case, we continue to have interest to move forward uh, MOUs that were in the pipeline or there are new ones uh, that are coming through. Then the second uh, slide, please. And the second slide would be about virtual meetings. Uh, our office takes care of the of the of the visits from international visitors because we are in the capital and because of the embassies, the number is very dynamic. And then what we do, what we have done is that we now carry out visits online. So not long ago, some partner from France uh, was asking us to still move forward with the online meeting, and, and we we needed to do that. And, and it sounds really strange, but it was new for us to move into an online environment for many reasons. But we learned various things by doing that. One is that institutions need to have an official online platform so they are comfortable using. In our case, and I suppose it's a case for some of you, we use, we use uh, Microsoft Teams. But then we find that for some partners, that, t that tool is actually fine, but for other partners, it is not. So we needed to be a little flexible in using other tools to make sure that Again, these online meetings take place. We also find that when it comes to, to online meetings, such as this one, uh, in our case, meet private meetings with partners, we need to have some kind of protocol in place. So therefore, there is, there is order, there is actually uh, a, a, an agenda, and things are follow up in the best way possible. And also, it requires that we, are, we do more prep work before. And that is because we believe that time passes differently when you are on live video, like right now. And obviously something that's very, very, very simple, but it's important is that we also needed to learn how to use this tool because we just didn't have the need to use it before. 
In relation to that, we were reflecting a lot about some of the changes that we have to go through as a team. And we find that obviously we meet, for example, I'm sure most of you do, do so, or a lot of you do so, which is we have meetings with the entire team, we have a smaller group meetings, and we have one to one meeting on a regular basis. But we found that this type of meetings has increased a certain type of communication. And as a result, we believe that some of our knowledge base is increasing. And I'm very, and I'm, I'm, you know, if you guys think about the fact that prior to COVID-19, you could just pop up into your, your, uh, your colleague office and ask any question, and then you could, you, you don't have to focus on the, on the, the details of, of the assignment. But now that we're at home, I think we, we find it is much, much useful to have information documented. And I'm referring to workflows and, uh, and also uh, numbers. We, a while ago, we started processing and uh, collecting more information for us to understand the impact of our services. But definitely during COVID-19, our, our experience is that having documented information actually is very, very valuable because uh, you have to do planning when it comes to when staff need to take vacation, when staff actually uh, need to take some time off for any reason. So we make sure that we continue operating in the best way possible. And it, Dan, if you go to the next slide in the last one, the last one has to do with our experience with international visitors and scholars. So we received about 150 uh, last year of the scholars that come through our office. There are different types of scholars at, at Carlton, so they are managed by different offices. But then this year we have had about 50 or so. Uh, we were expecting the number to increase uh, for 2020. Obviously, the number will, will stay the way it is. And then when it comes to that situation, what there are two things that we were reflecting. One is that in the case of Carlton, we actually process our visa and scholars inside, like their status are called on with a work permit. And this means, as far as we understand, and I was advised by my colleague who is an um, immigration advisor, is that from the perspective of IRCC employers, and that's technically us because we, we, we issue or we submit, uh, request a work permit, we are expected to offer support in the event that uh, international visa and scholars come to Carlton during COVID-19 and because they have to isolate themselves for 14 days. Obviously, as you all know, no international visa and scholar is coming for now for obvious reasons, so we don't have anyone coming for sure. But then we understand also that some universities, what they do is that they, they register their scholars in terms of a course, and they don't seem to be any kind of, uh, this does not, does not apply to them, so this is something that we continue to examine to see the best way we can move forward. The last point of this presentation is that um, we also realized when we're reflecting about the vision scholars is that while some of our vision scholars actually are students who come to Carlton for them to conduct research in the form of an internship and so on and so forth, some of the, we have others that are actually professors and actually they come to conduct research. Some of them come with their own funding, personal funding, others come with funding from the university. But we find that this is a population that has not been visible for other offices as well. So we concluded that perhaps we could do far more work in terms of increasing awareness about the contribution they actually make to, to the university. So these this, this were the things that we wanted to share uh, with you regarding some of these three aspects that we're now uh, working on. Thank you, Carlos. Appreciate the information. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna just request that folks on the call perhaps get in touch with Carlos directly if you've got follow-up questions. Um, and just to wrap things up, I'm going to turn it to Julio from uh, from Concordia to, to speak about some conclusions from today's session. Julio, please join us. Thank, thank Dan. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you to Trin, Emily, uh, Wen, Ben, and Carlos for sharing your ideas with our community. Can, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Carlos? Right. We have just a couple of minutes left, so I will try to be very brief and close this session by sharing six reflections based on the on some notes that I have been taking during your, the presentations. The first one is, um, I believe we all recognize that our world has changed and we need to start thinking strategically about how our office, the International Relations Office, will adapt to our new normal, whatever the new normal is. Someone says that life is not about waiting for the storm to pass, but it's about learning how to dance in the rain. This crisis is a great opportunity to innovate and do the things we have been postponing. Second, 
communicating and engaging with our stakeholders will be more important than ever before. We will need to collaborate and work closer with our partners to face the challenge ahead. In this topic, Tareen and Emily gave us a great example on how UBC is looking at engaging with their global partners on scenario planning around COVID-19. As part of the UBC a social responsibility strategy, she explained how her office is taking, uh, is, is taking the opportunity of the present crisis to be more inclusive. In this regard, some she, she, she presented some examples uh, on how UBC it's, it, it's, it's moving to do uh, virtual classrooms, virtual tours, and on online faculty seminars. Third, digital, digital, digital. We have heard a lot of this word in the past days. We need to accelerate new ways to simplify and digitalize our process, services, and interactions. This will be fundamental to support our activities. When in this context, Carlos gave us a great example on how Carlton University is preparing to go virtual, uh, uh, in, in, including virtual meetings and signing MOUs digitally. For uh, international travel will be reduced, but not eliminated. As the situation improves, we will need to start thinking about a framework to guide us through the return to international travel. In this regard, Ben gave us a very interesting presentation on, the, on his initiative to assess risk and better plan international travels. He, 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 he talked about um, how he has um, taken into consideration different factors when he it's, it's developing his plan. Fifth, uh, we need to find creative ways to support ongoing international partnership. Um, when uh, present us with a very interesting example of, uh, that is taking place at the University of Toronto, including promoting virtual collaboration and ready, redirecting resources from travel funds to student micro grants for global and thematic projects. Six and, and the final point is um, it's our universities in Canada relied on international talent, including academic visitors and visitor scholars who come to our labs every year. I think it's important in one, on one side to make sure that we review our policies to host them, but also as Carlos mentioned, to raise awareness on, of the visitors at our universities. Before closing this session, I would like to thank one more time, Carol, Dan and Carlos for organizing this meeting as well as CBIE for the support to our community. Thank you and have a good afternoon.